Today, we're looking at another episode of Answers News. I chose this one because of the sexist implication in the title, and then when I saw the panel, I saw this, an all-male panel. Then when I got to the episode, the original sexism I expected to find actually wasn't there. But the sexism was still strong with this one, so I stuck with it. This episode starts with a story about the demographics of South Korea, where the population is shifting to an older demographic. On a small island, the issue is seen more profoundly where there are just four children remaining. The headline says three, but the article mentions a fourth. The situation is partly a result of political pressures of population control in the 60s, and partially from changing social mores, where women are having children later, if at all. And this is just the one island of Nakdu, I think it is how you pronounce it. I may have butchered that, but that one particular island. And it's really looking at one rural town of about 100 people. So out of 100 people, there's only three school-aged children. So it's not a huge population we're looking at here, but it is a good sample and representative of the struggle happening throughout all of South Korea and many Asian nations, it would seem. Yeah, this one, it didn't say anything about it being through coerced abortions right. or anything like that, which sometimes is in China. Not it's, from the government, yeah, directly, it, but definitely a social coercion, it seems. Right. Yeah, Yeah. they had a statement from a, a young lady that um, if, if I have to choose students, between yeah. having a career and, have, and raising a child, I have no doubt whatsoever that I will choose my career, which we, we see that mentality or that attitude here in the United States a lot, that, that young girls are being told this is preferable. Um, they're, they're always, you know what's interesting, my wife and I talk about this, my wife brings this up, not me all the time. Your wife brings this up. Interesting that you recognize that this is a women's issue, not a men's issue. So you give a nod to the fact while you continue to discuss it on an all-male panel. She says, you know, what frustrates her so much is young girls are being told they can be anything they want to be. Except. And if they say, I want to be a mother, well, no, you can't be that. Or don't be a housewife. You, yeah, yeah that's, mm -hmm. as if that's... So it, just, it communicates the clear societal pressure here, and we yeah. see some other statements in the article talking about how people, are feel, uh, people feel pressured to be sterilized, whether that's the male or the female, and that really goes against what we think of as the biblical ethic of life, that life is a valuable thing, that that's to right. bring children into the world <clears throat> is a joy, and that our goal there then is to raise up children who will worship God. And, and honor. Note again. This is what my wife says, as if that means women agree too. The real issue here isn't whether or not there is a value of human life. Of course there's a value in human life and in perpetuation of the species. But first, you have a group of men saying, women, this is what you need to do with your lives. You need to bear and raise children. If any of you were actually capable of bearing children, this would be a little bit more acceptable, but it is just rich for someone who has no idea the cost, physically, mentally, and socially, for a woman to go through this, and then to sit here and say that this is what women need to do. Second, women should never be put in the position where they must choose between having children and having a career in the first place. You men can do both with no problem. Women should be given this opportunity too. How? Employer practices and federal laws that are pro-equality rather than pro-business. This means extended leave, like a full year for the birth of a child for both men and women, with no penalty returning to work after the year is up. And if you're thinking, Granny, how can a business operate if all the employees get a year off for the birth of a child? They're doing it now. In Lithuania and Hungary, parents have a total of 156 weeks of paid leave to share between them. Sweden and Estonia provide 480 days of paid leave. Iceland gives three months to the mother, three months to the father, and three months to be shared as the couple chooses. Norway allows 46 weeks of paid leave at 100% of salary or 56 weeks at 80%. Other countries that have at least 15 weeks of paid maternity-paternity leave include Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Bulgaria, Austria, Belgium, Chile, Croatia. You get the idea. There are many more. 
The United States is one of very few industrialized countries that doesn't require businesses to give paid maternity paternity leave. There are 193 countries in the United Nations, and those that do not mandate paid paternal leave include New Guinea, Suriname, a few island nations in the South Pacific, and the United States. That's it. If the United States really was a paragon of family values, valuing the family should include time off for the birth of a child. If these men actually cared about women and valued bringing children into the world, they should be petitioning for paternal leave policies that allow women to have equality in the workforce and allows them to raise a family too. Instead of shaking their fingers at women and telling them that they need to buck up and raise families the way God intended them to, how about accommodating the raising of a family in the modern world? How about wanting women to be all that they can be and allowing them their dreams and aspirations and a family instead of forcing them into a choice in the first place? How about learning what the problem is instead of assuming you have all the answers in your ancient book. This best-selling devotional has a prayer that literally says, Dear God, please help me to hate white people. This is a real book you can buy at Target. Now, this is kind of one of those uh, shocking headlines, and when I saw it, I expected it to be something along those lines, but then like actually... clickbait or something. Yeah, a little bit of clickbait, but I actually started reading and right off the page, images of the, of the actual book, and that's what it says. And you can see that there underlined, the opening of this prayer, Dear God, please help me to hate white people, or at least to want to hate them. At least I want to stop caring about them individually and collectively. A rather shocking statement. And as we think about uh, the, the context of this, this is a, a black woman who on her Twitter profile describes herself as a womanist theologian, and she mentions intersectional justice in those things. And these are all yeah. ideas that come to us out of the worldview of critical theory or critical race theory in this case. So if she's a womanist theologian, does she say a woman instead of a man? And now we have three white men judging a black woman for her views on race and feminism. Not that they aren't entitled to their viewpoint, but seriously, guys, if you're going to discuss race and sexual issues, a little diversity on the panel would be appropriate. I do think there is a place for an all-white panel to discuss racism when the panel is talking about what are we doing wrong and how can we do it better. But this is not what you're doing here. But the book itself is doing really well, rising on the charts of New York Times bestseller. So it's sold in Target and at Amazon, et cetera. So it is not a fringe book, and keep that in mind. And the ideology that she is really spewing here is not fringe in our culture anymore, unfortunately. This is really being pushed in workplaces, in training workplaces, in your schools, even in your lower age groups from kindergarten up through college. This critical theory ideology is permeating our culture. So as you read and hear these ideas, and hopefully you're shocked by them, be aware this is not a fringe movement. Mm -hmm. It is very much in the mainstream, unfortunately. So we're to be ready to deal with this for ourselves, for our kids, and the coming generations. I, I seem to remember there was a very well-known civil rights leader who had a dream that people would be judged by the content of their character rather yeah. than by the color of their skin. You know, I'm not qualified to comment on this either. So let's bring in someone who is. Cynthia McDonald is a social worker and has been a guest on several of my streams. Cynthia, what are your views on this? Hello, my name is Cynthia McDonald. I'm a reoccurring host on the nonprofits. I also host my own show called The 13%, and Chronicles of the Revolutionary Nerd. Now this particular reaction is to the commentary on the prayer contained in the best-selling devotional, A Rhythm of Prayer, a collection of meditations for renewal, entitled, Dear God, Please Help Me Hate White People. So I'm going to play the portion of the video that I'm going to react to, and I'll meet you back. But what people are being told today is that if you are um, if Caucasian, if you're white, then that means you are part of the op oppressor class and everybody else is being oppressed by you. Therefore, it's right to hate you. It's right, That's to, right. 
to pray to God that you would hate them even more. Yeah, and now, as I looked into the context of this a little bit, the, the author uh, put out a statement on her uh, a personal blog and some other things, and other people were claiming that we're really just taking this out of context. And what she was trying to do was to develop a lament and say that this is her lived experience, this is the way she's experienced the world. There are certain white people who are allies and she likes them because they're supporting her and there are others who are terrible neo-Nazis and, and she never wants God to, God to deal with them in any way, but it's this middle group, which sounded a lot like white evangelicals and she mentions the Trump supporting Fox News watching. So we get a lot of political flavor in, uh, in this prayer that she's offering. And as I think about, uh, Tim, the, the different types of laments and imprecatory psalms that are in the Bible that she's trying to compare this to, do you see that as a legitimate comparison here? Not at all. Um, there are times where the psalmist will express frustration with the Babylonians or with you know some people group who were very violent and did horrible things to, um, to the Jewish people. And so you'll see that, but it's not based on race. It's, or if they agree with you. Or, yeah. And right. it really, Roger, you hit it on a little bit. There is a very strong political element to this that she includes in there, which shows that it's not just a her lived experience. We'll read a little bit more because we want you to really understand just how vile this ideology truly is. And I was telling them earlier before the show, you know, you read that first paragraph and you think it can't get worse. And then it does. And then it gets even more worse. And you can tell, and a lot of her prayers aren't just geared or directed towards white people, but actually towards those who are professing Christians, which is yeah. also a difference compared to imprecatory the, prayers. And the other thing with the imprecatory psalms, you don't see a prayer in there for the psalmist to hate them more, to give them more hate toward these right. people. It's, God, you bring judgment on them because of what they did. It's calling on the Lord to act in judgment, which maybe isn't the, you know, from our perspective, we do want justice to be done, but we also want God's grace and mercy to be poured out, and we want the best for these people. But you can yeah. understand if your family's been wiped out or your whole nation's been wiped out, having some, um, some bitterness and, and, sure. and unleashing that. So here's um, a bit more context. Here's another part of her prayer. Again, she specifies she doesn't hate the white or the woke whites, those who agree with her, or those neo-Nazi types. My prayer, she says, is that you, Lord God, would help me to hate other white people. You know, the nice ones. The Fox-loving, Trump-supporting voters who don't see color, but make thinly-veiled racist comments. They're happy to have me over for dinner. Those sort of white people, those who would welcome black people into their churches, those are the ones that she is saying, I really need to learn to hate them, Lord. Give me a hatred towards them. And again, this is rooted in critical theory, ideology. They're the oppressors. I've been oppressed. That's my lived experience. Therefore, that is what is true. I'm going to flesh that out in my life. And I think we can tell pretty easily that's not in line with any biblical prayer. These are three white men attempting to explain in a rational manner why this Black woman's prayer or lament is so problematic. To give context, they give a description of the author and this prayer as womanist theologian intersectional justice, uh, which is actually from, as they mentioned, the author's Twitter profile. One of the panelists goes on to say, and this comes from the worldview of critical race theory. Now here is the straw man argument. They are using the subject of CRT or critical race theory to correlate it with this woman's prayer to attack the theory itself, therefore misrepresenting its meaning. As you saw, they also mentioned how CRT is being pushed into workplaces and schools to add shock value of why they believe this theory is so damaging. Critical race theory is an intellectual movement and loosely organized framework of legal analysis based on the premise that race is not a natural biological grounded feature of physical distinct subgroups of human beings, but a socially constructed, culturally invented category that is used to oppress and exploit people who aren't white. Critical race theorists hold that the law and legal institutions of the United States are inherently racist insofar as they function to create and maintain social, economic, and political inequalities between whites 
and non-whites, especially African-Americans. Now, one of the panelists quoted Dr. King, I have a dream speech, specifically judging people not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. This is especially infuriating because this is the general go-to quote, especially by white supremacists that want to tout notions that racism does not exist. This also shows that the panelists had no idea what Dr. King's politics really were, including him having a scathing criticism of white moderates, especially to those who hold Judeo-Christian values. Now, this is a direct quote from Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham jail that contains his aforementioned criticism. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. Another issue is again the panelists purporting the notion of oppression through white supremacy to this woman in particular's loose statement of it being okay to hate white people. This obvious conflation is another straw man argument. So to help them build their stance, you see how they mention how the author of the prayer stated that people were taking her words out of context. But then one of the panelists stated that though this was a lament of her personal experience as a black woman, it should not be compared to the laments of David had specifically in Psalms. The panelist mentions how David was frustrated with the Babylonians in particular due to their violence against the Jews, but that was not based on race. So, i.e., it should not apply here. Sir! So white supremacist has not been violent towards African-Americans. So we're just going to forget how slaves were punished by lashing of the cat of nine tails, plus other punishment tactics. We're going to forget about the over 4,000 recorded lynchings during Jim Crow. We're also going to forget about how black people are four times more likely to get stopped by the police and possibly lose their lives. We're going to forget Ahmaud Arbery, Sandra Bland, Laquan McDonald, Breonna Taylor, Jacob Blake, George Floyd. Cleanse, you know, David talks about cleansing his heart, you know, that he yeah. needs that rather than this where, I mean, there's even a prayer in here, and Brian, I think you were probably going to talk about it, to harden my heart. Can you imagine praying to God yeah. to have your heart hardened against certain people? And yet Jesus tells us, I mean, this is somebody who is claiming to be coming from a Christian perspective, um, Jesus tells us to love one another, to love your neighbor, to love your enemy. I think that covers everybody. One of the panelists mentioned the prayer using the phraseology, harden my heart, specifically harden my heart, that were Trump loving, Fox News watching, et cetera, et cetera. When it comes to her lament, 
the author using this phraseology is quite biblical in her mentions. Did not God harden the heart of Pharaoh towards the children of Israel when Moses went to the Pharaoh and said, let my people go? Are we not supposed to be God-like in our behavior? Because that's exactly what God did, according to the Bible. It is also such utter BS concerning their mentioning the lament having a political bend instead of her lived experience. This again, from them, the ought she possesses is based on some arbitrary means. The whole bend on using terms like political is such a red herring. One fact being concerning a person's politics are absolutely based on their lived experiences. Also, the wonderful gem of one of the panelists stating that the impregnator Psalms did not contain David's professing hatred for others. Excuse me? Does not Psalm say, contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me? Fight against those who fight against me. Take up shield and buckler. Arise and come to my aid. Brandish spear and javelin against those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Psalms 109 also says, let there be none to extend mercy unto him. Neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. That does not sound like feel good sermons to me. Now they mentioned this part of her prayer, Walker Barnes. She says, my prayer is that you would help me to hate the other white people. You know, the nice ones. The Fox News loving, Trump supporting voters who don't see color, but who make thinly veiled racist comments about those people. The people who are happy to have me over for dinner, but alert the neighborhood watch anytime an unrecognized person of color passes their house. But I found it quite fascinating they failed to mention her saying in the same prayer, Lord, if you can't make me hate them, at least spare me from their perennial gaslighting, white mansplaining, and white woman tears. This is important to mention because microaggressions are a very real thing that non-white, especially Black people, face in the institutions we interact with. I could also conjecture that the very thing I perceive these gentlemen doing is white mansplaining why this woman is wrong in her lament and she is not representing Christian values. Yeah, and towards the end, as you read through the entire thing, it's, it's about four pages on this, in this devotional prayer book, as it's called. She tries to make that shift toward, um, I'm going to love all people anyway, but it, as Tim mentioned earlier, this really doesn't reflect the pattern that we see in scripture. We should be asking God to give us a heart of compassion toward people who are not like us, who we have a hard time loving. I'm, I'm one of those cowboy up, get it done, kind of get back in your saddle, let's move on kind of guys. Not much compassion coming for me. So I've had to work on that, but that's a way that I take the ways that I'm not like Christ and ask God to transform me more and more into the image of Christ. In those oh, I've ways. been waiting for that day that he would do that to you. No, I've, been pr- I've been praying so hard for you, brother. It's if, working. Uh, Keep it you up. think I'm a jerk now, you should have known me back let then. Me just, uh, so there's another, yeah, there's another statement You read that here. quote? Yeah, yeah let me see them it. as hopelessly unrepentant, reprobate, reprobate bigot to blaspheme the Holy Spirit and who need to be handed over to the evil one. Talking about Why, be, white because people. of the color of somebody's yeah. skin, that's what you're called. But look, let's bring this back to what Scripture teaches, that we all... Everybody in this world, everybody who's ever lived, goes back to Adam and Eve. We are all made of one blood. That's we right. all come go back to Noah and his wife uh, later than Adam and Eve. And uh, we all have the same problem, sin. We've all rebelled against our Creator. And we all have the same solution. Uh, we need the same solution. That is Jesus Christ. They then try to summarize the solution in this neat bow. That we all come from one blood. We come from Noah. We come from Adam. We come from Eve. And we all have the same problem of sin. And the solution is Christ. Insert, we fall down, but we get up here. 
This is so problematic. Oftentimes, just using this red herring argument of sin is the problem, but Jesus is the solution makes one fail to deal with the real issues we face as a nation. Facts are that America is a racist country, even though Senator Tim Scott says it's not. Facts are we still deal with the notions that certain groups of people are superior to others, and that sensibility has bled into our systems and institutions that govern us to this very day. My final take on this particular video is that these gentlemen engaged in approximately 11 minutes of fallacious arguments rooted in their white male privilege and ignorance. This is unfortunate and excessively many hold these same notions. My advice is instead of asking Jesus for forgiveness because all have sinned and fallen short from the grace of God, is to actually listen to people who have different lived experiences than you. Paleogeneticists are instructed to be careful that science doesn't end up controlling the narrative as another scientific discipline falls to the woke warriors. So what we have here is a description of paleogenetics. So that would be looking at the uh, ancient DNA characteristics or trying to discern those by looking at uh, different mutation clusters in different people groups and how they may have migrated and how they inherited those things. Uh, Dr. Nathaniel Jeanson, who we work with, mm -hmm. has done a lot of work in this area, trying to trace back the lineage of the different people groups that we see, especially uh, in the context of spreading out from uh, the Tower of Babel That's after right. the judgment there. And looking at the DNA and how these different groups are related to one another, we can put them back into uh, basic people groups in the way that they spread out over time. And here we have a, a warning from this group of scientists to other scientists who are studying this ancient DNA to be careful not to let the science drive the story that you're telling with your data. And that seems to be the exact opposite of what we would expect. And that's why here the, the title of the article is saying that the woke culture has overtaken uh, this segment of science. Yes, evidently, you, you, from a woke perspective, you follow the science until it disagrees with your narrative, and then you abandon the science and keep to your story. I'm really surprised that they would comment on this, as they obviously don't hold themselves to the same standard as they do the rest of the scientific community. I looked further into this article, and it is a real issue, but it isn't scientists telling scientists not to violate their narrative, as they would have you believe. It's Native Americans asking the scientists not to discredit their culture by investigating the DNA origins of ancient Native American remains. It seems that the DNA indicates that there have been more migrations from Europe than previously thought, and Native American people are worried about losing their distinction as a people group, as the DNA evidence shows that they are more closely related to Europeans than was originally thought. This story comes from Canada. Native Americans in Canada are concerned that this information will cost them the hard-fought for right to be accepted as a distinct people group, and that they were wronged by European invaders who took their land. The Native Americans had given the scientists the right to test the DNA on the remains of their ancestors. But when the results didn't fit the history that they've been teaching for centuries, they wanted to revoke that right to study the data and they wanted to keep the data from being found and published. The issue came up in a science conference, and the ethics of the situation was discussed. Do we suppress our data because of the harm that it causes to this people group with regards to their culture? It's not a question of scientists having an agenda to prove and finding that the data doesn't fit the agenda of the scientists, as this panel would have you think. Roger Patterson is comparing this to the work of Dr. Nathaniel Jameson, an AIG scientist with a PhD in cell development from Harvard. Jensen does have legitimate scientific credentials, as do a few of the staff of AIG. However, Jensen's major work in the field of genetic study that Roger is referencing here is 
replacing Darwin, the new origin of the species. It's the book they have featured on the table there. I found this review of the book from Herman L. Mays, Jr. Mays is an evolutionary biologist at Marshall University. Jeanson, in replacing Darwin, carefully creates a narrative in which data from comparative genetics appears to point to a young history of life on Earth. He does so, largely ignoring virtually all of the science that says otherwise, from geology to physics to paleontology. Instead, he brushes whole fields of scientific inquiry aside to look only at a carefully chosen and misleading set of data from genetics that conveniently gives him an answer that just so happens to fit with the statement of faith in a literal Bible that he had to sign as a condition of employment at Answers in Genesis. Such a contract that would be unheard of among any actual working scientists, myself included. There is little evidence in this book that Jensen has a grasp on the relevant science of population genetics, however. For example, he claims that he is using standard coalescence calculations from coalescent theory that he derived from an undergraduate textbook on evolution, see location 3075 in the Kindle version of Replacing Darwin. However, the calculations he is using have virtually nothing to do with coalescent theory. The coalescent is a complex body of theory and methods that allows genetics to trace the history of gene copies in a population and elucidate the effects of demographics, such as effective population size, on the time that elapsed from when the two gene copies in the population could be traced to a single gene copy in the past. There is not one place, one method, or one citation in replacing Darwin that could be properly viewed as relevant to coalescent theory. These sorts of errors, both trivial factual errors and fundamental conceptual ones, are throughout the book. Jensen, for example, ignores the distinction between de novo mutation rates obtained from pedigrees and substitution rates, the latter of which is referring to the accumulation of fixed neutral genetic differences between lineages and the basis for assumptions underlying molecular clock approaches. He uses cherry-picked per-generation mutation rates rather than neutral substitution rates to create the illusion that comparative genetic data support a history of life that goes back only a few thousand years. A conclusion virtually every professional scientist on the planet would find absolutely absurd. Jensen's book was published in 2017 by Master Books. On their website, Master Books says about itself, With every book and homeschool resource we publish, our aim is to increase the reader's faith in God, our Creator, and the authority of His Word. In a world that is increasingly at war against God, we are unapologetically defending the Bible and equipping the Church to do the same. Please tell me about how you are not seeking to make the data fit your narrative. If the entire point was to say, other scientists do it too, that doesn't make your work any better. It just says that other people make the same mistakes you do. So please tell me about how Jensen's book didn't have a narrative that he was trying to prove with his data, but that the scientists at this conference being asked by a group of Native Americans to suppress their data out of respect for their culture did. Right, because they're, yeah. they're dealing with, with, like we talk about, ancient people groups, people, people who have cultural roots that go far back and they've cherished these traditions or stories or legends that are part of their past. And if you have scientists come in and do some DNA studies and say, uh, actually, we've learned that those things are not true. You didn't really come from whatever you think you came from. Here's yeah. where your people came from. And um, if, if you're being insensitive in how you present that, there's one person that cautions, hey, if, if we do make those discoveries, be sensitive in how you present it. That's good advice. Tim Chaffee actually read the article. I'm impressed. Yes, this is exactly what the article is saying. When scientific discoveries disprove the cultural beliefs in a group, be sensitive in how you present these findings. You pretty much have to make an exception for AIG, though, as anything presented to them with anything less than a sledgehammer. A few wax. Is going to be summarily dismissed. 
the problem is, as we think about um, understanding science and how to analyze all this data, we want to interpret the data as, uh, as generically as possible, but we never want to abandon our biblical starting point in those areas. So we're always going to look at the data through the lens of Scripture. And now you admit that you don't practice what you preach. You want secular scientists to be free from any bias imposed on them to not present data that conflicts with the history of a people group, but then you blatantly admit that all of your research and study must conform to your starting narrative, and no data that disagrees with your narrative will even be considered. Good job. You've just proven that what you do isn't scientific at all. Now, for the most part, we would assume that these other scientists are going to try to look at uh, these things through the most neutral, naturalistic lens, uh, the evolutionary lens that man has evolved through these different uh, groups over time, and then tell their story, their narrative based on that. But here, they're cautioning to not let that data overthrow the origins stories of people uh, from different tribes here in United States and up in Canada. But if it comes to Christians or, or Jews, if it comes to anything that from the biblical perspective right. and science allegedly disproves that, well, you can shout that from the mountaintops and be as insensitive as you want to be and tell That's them right. how stupid they are for believing that. But if it comes to any other group, it just... And now we get to the poor us, we're being persecuted narrative. First, you as Christians hold the dominant position as religious beliefs go in the United States, though you are falling fast. Second, you do have a point on being sensitive and presenting evidence that is going to show someone's entire way of life to being built on a false belief. But you people have been shown this data over and over. When you are shown the clear proof that your biblical narrative about the flood is completely falsifiable, as you are continuing to do here, you ignore the evidence and say that anyone that disagrees with you is just insensitive to your position. Please, tell me when you have ever shown any sensitivity to any position other than your own. Amazing, as we study genetics, how much genetics is affirming, confirming the Bible again and again and again. We expect that from a biblical worldview. I'd like to see the data to back that claim. I'm guessing he's referring to Jameson's book, a book that hasn't been accepted by anyone in the scientific community and is published as a religious book, not a science book. If AIG actually had any science that could prove their biblical narrative, they would share it with the scientific world so that it could go through peer review. But since they know that their data is incapable of surviving such scrutiny, they stick to their little closed world where nothing can reach them, but they also can reach nothing on the outside either. All right, next article. Um, Pioneering Pollinator Study offers clues to Darwin's abominable mystery. Now this mystery was supposedly how the different pollinators and the flowers that they pollinate could have co-evolved with one another over time. So if you think about a, a bright red flower, and it's growing and it's got a cup and the nectar's way down in the base of this cup. Whatever comes along to get that nectar has to have a tongue or a beak long enough to get inside there mm -hmm. and extract that nectar. And this becomes a bit of an evolutionary quandary because what developed first, the long tongue to get in there or the deep flower that necessitated that. And it seems to be this bit of a, a chicken and egg problem for the evolutionary mm -hmm. explanations of these. I discuss this exact question with Brainbug in my video Sinful Science 2. A link is in the description. I have to wonder if the panel really doesn't know the answer to the question of the evolution of butterflies and flowers, or if they just pretend they don't know so that they can refuse to look at the answer. Most likely it's the latter. As a believer, I found these kind of arguments compelling because they prevent you from looking for the answer. When they say, scientists don't know the answer, people are unlikely to look for an answer as they've just been told there is no answer, you won't find it. At least that's why I never looked into such claims. I had a similar conversation with a young earth creationist on Twitter. The young earth creationist claimed that scientists don't know how the eye could evolve 
as an eye can't work with all of its components. So I sent him a short video explaining how the eye evolved. And then he said, well, the circulatory system could not evolve because without a heart, blood can't move. And without blood vessels, it has no way to travel. And without blood, a heart and vessels are useless. So unless they all popped into existence simultaneously, they cannot exist. I didn't know the answer to this one, so I looked it up and I sent him another short video. Incidentally, to all of you out there making videos that explain these kinds of stuff clearly and precisely, and I am talking specifically to you, stated clearly, Erica Gutsick Gibbon, Jackson Wheat, Professor Stick, and the rest, your work is very helpful. Please continue. He still insisted that we don't know which came first and claimed that I hadn't answered the question. I told him blood came first. Just look at the video. He said, no, that's just a fairy tale. And he refused to look at it. This is exactly the vibe that I'm getting here from Roger. Scientists don't know the answer to this one. And if you show me evidence to the contrary, I'll just dismiss it without looking at it because it must be wrong. But Roger's error here is much deeper than just ignoring the contrary evidence. He ignores even the article in front of him that is trying to explain it. There is nothing in the article about an evolutionary mystery about which came first, the butterfly proboscis or the long-necked flower. Here is the article. Here is the mystery it talks about, and it doesn't come until near the end of the article. It says, Charles Darwin, fascinated by what he described as the abominable mystery of diverse flowering plant species, famously predicted that the Malagasy star orchid, I'm skipping over the Latin, which has a white flower and 35 centimeter nectar spur, must be pollinated by a then undiscovered hawk mouth with a 35 centimeter proboscis. Exactly such a hawk mouth pollinator was discovered decades after his prediction confirming his hypothesis. So the issue wasn't which evolved first, as Roger claims. It was where is the animal that pollinated this flower? Darwin hypothesized that such a creature existed, and lo and behold, a few decades later, it was discovered. The continuing mystery that this article addresses is the mechanation of speciation of pollinating species, when a factor like the color of the flower is changed. What they found was that the pollinators adapted with fewer genetic changes to the flower change than they expected, resulting in the conclusion that speciation in pollinators shifts more rapidly and easier than expected. But this study has, has taken uh, genetic variations in different flowers, and it's turned the flowers from bright reds to softer tones like whites and pinks, and that attracts a different type of pollinator. And if you think about a, a hummingbird, you may have seen little moths buzzing around. They're called hawk moths that kind of imitate a hummingbird. And they've got the long proboscis to stick down in there and grab yeah. that nectar as well. And when they change the flower color, as we would expect, the pollinator changed. And the hawk moth was able to pollinate this flower rather than just the hummingbird. Well, kind of, sort of. It says that hawkmouths don't normally pollinate monkey flowers because they are red and hawkmouths don't see red as well. Monkey flowers are usually pollinated by hummingbirds that prefer red flowers. The scientists here genetically altered the monkey flowers so that only some were red and made others white and some pink. So the scientists didn't take flowers with genetic variations for the experiment they created genetically altered flowers for the experiment. Hawk mouths were raised in the lab for this experiment and were put with the genetically altered flowers, and they pollinated with the pink and white flowers, but not the red ones, despite the fact that hawk mouths don't pollinate with monkey flowers at all in the wild. But by altering the color of the flower, the hawk mouth will now pollinate with this flower, but only the light colored ones. So Roger isn't completely mischaracterizing the article, but he makes it sound like that there were hummingbirds involved in the experiment as well, and that they also were pollinating the flowers and the hawkmouths joined them, except there were no hummingbirds involved at all, just the hawkmouths. 
What Ranger does completely mischaracterize is the point of the experiment. It wasn't to try to find out which came first, the pollinator or the flower. It was to find out how easily a pollinator would adapt to a genetic change in the flower. The answer was that the hawk moths adapted to a new food source very easily when the food source was adapted so that they could see it better. The conclusion, we have shown that the critical steps toward the origin of a new experimentally synthesized hawkmouth pollinated plant species can be predicted based on a fundamental knowledge of pollination syndromes and genetics, said Dr. Kelsey Byers, who conducted the experiment. Our study shows that changes in flowering plant pollination syndrome can proceed through relatively few genetic changes, and this further suggests that only a few simple genetic changes might be required for the origin of a new species. Nothing to do with what evolved first. So at that point, the flower evolved into a cow, correct? No, it's still a flower. Okay. Still the same. Brian is trying to be funny, but if a flower produced a cow as offspring, this would completely disprove evolution. This would, in fact, show a supernatural force to be involved. So the fact that he thinks he's being funny by joking that the flower is still a flower, as if that somehow proves that their god created flowers, and they didn't evolve, is ironic. And basically, all this is showing is you change the color of the flower, you change who the flower attracts to do the pollination. It shows some maybe how you get speciation within flowering plants, but they're still flowering plants. That's all they are. There's no change from a flower to a cow. Except that was the point of the experiment. They were looking to see how evolutionary changes occur. They are looking for the mechanism, not to determine whether or not evolution occurs. We know evolution occurs. The first step in the experiment was to create a new species of monkey flower. Your real complaint here is that the experiment wasn't seeking to do what you want to see. So maybe the answer is to look for an experiment that actually does seek to do what you are looking for. This would be like if I wanted to go and buy meat and I went to the flower store and I said, aha, there must be a meat shortage because this is a store. Meat is sold in stores and they don't have any meat here. No, I'm just at the wrong store, that's all. And really, and you got to be careful, if you read just the title to the article, you know, a pioneering pollinator study offers clues to Darwin's abominable mystery. We're having answers that confirm evolution. Now, all you're showing is flowers make flowers and hummingbirds. Hummingbirds, just variation within the kind like God created. So look with a discerning eye as you kind of read those titles. He makes it sound like he's offering wisdom here, but look at the title. It makes no claims about evolution or that it proves evolution. Even the summary before the article says, research into the flower preferences of pollinating moths may have delivered a vital clue to the simple factors needed for the emergence of a new species. Nothing about anything turning into something else. Neither the title nor the summary makes any claims even remotely about what he is warning his listeners about. <laughs> Was the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden really an apple? And it's right there on your computer. Yeah, it's right there. Okay. But when we think about the forbidden fruit, does Scripture ever actually tell us, Tim, what the fruit was? Uh, yes, it was fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's <laughs> all we know. <laughs> right. But as we think about what it, did it taste the way like, it's right? been described in literature or it was bad, so probably yeah, chili. put into, <laughs> put into uh, to images like stained glass that we see here, it's often represented as an apple. And this is one of those times where I felt really smart because I had this idea thinking, well, Latin, the word for apple is malum, Mm -hmm. and that also means evil. And so before I had even heard this idea, that was kind of my conjecture in my mind that that's probably how this came about. So do you think that's a reasonable Yeah, that, that's hypothesis. very reasonable because you don't see it in, in Jewish artwork. You know, they're reading the Hebrew Bible and they, they, it just calls it a fruit, you know, a typical word for fruit. So that you don't see the apple being the, the type of fruit in their artwork. But what you do see is that this is popping up ever since the Latin Vulgate around, Jerome translated the Latin Vulgate around 400 AD. And uh, so he uses a word that can be confused for an apple, even at the time it just meant fruit yeah. as well. I really chose to do this episode because of the title, Did Eve Eat an Apple? 
and when I saw that it was a panel of all men, I wondered if they were going to blame all of the sin of the world on Eve for eating the apple. So I was rather disappointed that the only point of this discussion is to point out that the Bible, as is so often the case, is completely unclear as to what the fruit was that Adam and Eve are supposed to have eaten that was supposed to have created the downfall of man. But I do find it interesting that the idea of the fruit being an apple evolved from the Latin word for fruit. Even more interesting is that these guys are discussing how various methods evolved into the current beliefs about what the Bible means without recognizing how much this undercuts their claim that there is only one way to interpret the Bible, their way, and that the Bible never changes. Yes, it does. It meant one thing before it was translated into Latin, and while the words didn't change, the understanding of it changed after the translation. It makes you wonder how much more meaning was changed as the Bible was translated into other languages as well. Yeah, And this is a good reminder that we need to be careful with letting images and other outside ideas influence the way we think about Scripture and let Scripture be the guide. You mean like all your books and resources and your new streaming service? You heard it here from Roger. Don't buy any of AIG's resource materials. It could influence you in the way you think about Scripture. We should just read the Bible and let the Bible speak for itself. In that case, I recommend to you Junk Shop Library's Improv Bible Study. All he does is read the King James Version of the Bible. Or Hammett Meta's series on the Bible, where he points out everything wrong with each chapter of the Bible. Just reading the Bible with no one to color how you interpret it tends to turn believers into atheists. So maybe this isn't the best recommendation for a believer to be making? Live your life.